So here we have The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. And before I get into my notes here on the poem, I wanted to give you a little bit of background um, into my own reading of this poem, which is um, beyond uh, a personal reading, but comes with um, about 28 years of understanding this poem and thinking about this poem now, but also having majored in uh, creative writing and English uh, throughout college, um, this poem comes up a lot beyond introductory classes. Um, as a poet, um, I spent, uh, Robert Frost was the first poet I, I really read. I used to go uh, to the library. I used to sneak off to the library when I was about 11 or 12 years old, my mom would, a single parent mom would tell me to stay home. But we lived uh, by a river and on the other side of the river was the library. So um, the most nefarious thing that I would do uh, as a child uh, to be a disobedient child was to go to the library. That was my, my rebelling against my mother in many ways. I'm sure I've, I, I'm, I've got other things, but because this is a class, um, I mean, those were really the most um, dangerous things that I did. And I would go and I would read Robert Frost's poems uh, because I had heard about him in school and um, he was really the only poet they had mentioned. And I thought, I really like this poem. I'm going to go read his stuff. I didn't think about it. And, you know, this was in the 1990s. So um, didn't think about any other poets, couldn't know any other poets, and they had the card catalog and the computer was just like this new thing. So it couldn't really categorize other poets. And I didn't know how to research, so I didn't know how to like, you know, I, I would, I remember, and I was too, too nervous to ask librarians for help of other poets. But, you know, Robert Frost has been in my life for, I would say, almost 30 years now, uh, 28 plus years. And, um, in college, we studied him in poem classes and then um, in lit classes. And then uh, I also took a graduate class in which Robert Frost was one of the only two poets that we studied for 15 weeks. So, you know, sometimes I think that's important to know because sometimes students, freshman students in particular with poetry, will resist wanting to hear the professor slash authority slash experts opinion of a poem that they may have heard or that even if they hadn't heard student wants his or her opinion or their opinion. And um, all of that is to say that it's okay to take a poem and use it for your own life on some level what what it means to you but within the confines of literary analysis and with time spent um, and with the idea of giving the writer his or her or their due with regard to craft and intentions you know we can never know exactly what a writer has intended exactly and um, even as a poet, I know that there are things I am exploring, but that I don't always have or nearly never have a definitive idea, but that we have intentions. Um, and, we, you know, some of those things involve tone and being able to understand as if the poet is reading this, are we supposed to take it literally or figuratively? And then we look into all of those clues that we can to kind of figure that out, especially if we're reading it on our own in silence and we cannot hear the voice. So uh, I, I wanted to preface all of my notes with that. And you can see on the screen, you probably are getting distracted by, and hopefully you'll go back and hear some of that stuff. My notes here. So the road not taken, you know, two, two roads diverged in a yellow wood 
and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden back. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere, ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that made all the difference. So, you know, reading the poem, messed up a couple of little lines here and there, but you get the gist. Hopefully you hear some of the tonal ways that you can read this poem, not so literally. You have to imagine that. So then let's go back to the notes. You know, right away, you look at the, the road not taken, the title, and, you know, that is misconception, uh, mis often misconceived to mean, like, you choose the right, the road that other people don't take, that, that path, that, ever, that, that really hard path, or, you know, and, and I don't, you, let's not just take that at face value and think that that has to mean that, because at the end of the poem, he takes that road and kind of satirically says that made all the difference. But, you know, really that title, when I write that it's ironic as if you consider the road imagined not taken. And that's because he doesn't take the easy path necessarily um, or that other path. Um, that one that people often see is the one that will lead to, you know, whatever gold so to speak. Um, but often, you know, when we're older, we think about the things we hadn't done. And so really that line isn't just endorsing of, you know, oh, this is the road that others don't take, but it's also a reflection upon our own ideas of regret when we make choices. Oh, the road I didn't take. You know, just as an example, very quickly, when I was younger, I quit football because it didn't work in my family. Um, and I didn't want to quit. And I, I thought, oh, this is going to be regretful all of high school. And then, you know, you, I miss, I love football and I miss it and I miss it. And as I get older, you know, you think, oh, that's going to change my life. It's going to change how I could have done this and I could have done that. And then you get to a point where you just think, I made that choice. And um, who knows what would have happened? You know, the statistics with football anyway, once you get to a certain point and you're no longer um, of an age in which you can be a professional athlete, you start realizing that there's more to life than what if I was, you know? And um, so that road not taken isn't necessarily just about, oh, choosing the right path. It's often about like that whole reflection of just that. Why, why do we do this as people? We, we do. And you can see that in the first stanza, which is it's the setting up of the concept right away. Two diver roads diverged in a yellow wood. So we're starting with this image, this natural image, and that the roads diverge um, in this woods. So it's this beautiful woods. And sorry, I could not travel both. And then in the second, immediately recognizing and being regretful that you can't take both lines. You can't take both. And, you know, then it goes into as far as I could. And I think that's really important to think about the ideas of making choices. When we do make choices, um, depending on our imaginative abilities, and that's why I love this poem on another level too, you can see the easy path and the clear path and that one that's going to take you a certain way. And then you see this other path that might have barriers right away for you to see, you know, 
And I don't think he's telling us, be Bear Grylls, go and, and hunker down and be the person who goes into nature and, and tries to conquer nature. He's really using that image to talk about how we see these different choices. And for some of them, we see obvious barriers. And for other, other, the other choice, we don't necessarily see the bent undergrowth. <laughs> You know, uh, just as an example, students will often write about college and how, oh, you make the choice to go to college because it's the easy path to success. And as a college professor and as somebody who has gone from poverty to middle class, um, college seemed like the thing to do to be the easier way to become middle class and to avoid, you know, or to not avoid, but couldn't avoid it. We were but to um, move past poverty, you know, you think, well, here are the choices. I can go to college and get a degree that's going to allow me to make more money, hopefully, or I'm not going to go to college. I'm going to work in a factory or uh, in a service industry job, which was what a lot of my uncles and aunts and my mom ended up doing back in Ohio. And that seems like a hard path to move out of poverty both physically exhausting jobs, financially not rewarding, you know, very important jobs as we see at this time in, in society. And I've always valued these jobs, but they're not the easy path to having financial security. But college is, is painted that way. And it was when I was in college or when I, when I was in high school, people would say, go to college, this is your, your key to success. And it just seemed like the, the thing to do. It was the easy way of being middle class. Um, but I can tell you for you know, 20 years since I graduated high school, there has still been bends in the undergrowth. You know? the, and, and I bet some of you, especially returning students, understand this more um, and, and those of you who students, you know, who, who have parents have, have taught you this, that, I mean, as a professor, I've had barriers with regard to the, the idea that there's different levels in which of pay and, um, and part-time versus full-time and tenure versus non-tenure track. And it's a very difficult path. And then we went through a recession and there's not a lot you know, you can't see that a recession is coming when you're 18 and the, the, the economy is going well. You see a clear path to go to college and get a job. Life isn't that easy. Um, and so I think that's a lot of what we, we're set up with as far as we can see. And with choices, that's the one thing to kind of, I take away from the poem and try to give to you as my students and just to people in general. Don't see this poem as so limiting of just make the right choice because, I mean, life is filled with lots of bends and and, the, and the, the first stanza sets that up and then we move into the second stanza which kind of emphasizes that idea that these two choices that you're presented these roads you know we come across these roads which one's the right way which one's the right way and immediately within setting that and saying you can only see this far down these roads but let me tell you here in stanza two they're that both roads are just as fair they're worn equally about the same. And then as it shifts into the third stanza, that first line there. And both that morning, when I came to those choices, they're both equal. Because, and as it says in that, in that um, 12th line, in leaves no step had trodden black, meaning no one has walked all over the earth in, the, in that time period, in that moment. So... You know, those choices there, it's not about making the choice between the, the one that everybody takes and the one that nobody takes. It's really like at this time and in, in place, it's my choice to make and they're equal, you know. And then that middle line with the exclamation point, and you see in my notes, I put it in purple, the exclamation indicates not only that regret that we heard earlier, but that he knowingly is lying to himself. It's kind of that, oh, I kept the first for another day. Because he immediately in the next line says, yet knowing how way leads unto way. Well, if we know that you're keeping this, this choice for another day, possibly, you're going to go this way and that way. 
You know, so if we take that whole idea of college choices again, you know, that doesn't mean that you're never going to have the choice to go to college again, but the choices are going to be different down the line. You know, you might come back to that choice later of this road of continuing down where I've been going or this new road, this opportunity has come back to me again, you know, and, and, and that's also a fear. I doubted if I should ever come back. Will I come back to college? Will I come back to this job opportunity? You know, to get beyond college when you're beyond college and it's like, do I take this job or that job? And you're wondering, oh, do I take this job? And if I take this job, what will happen? You know, just very quickly, um, when I was going to grad school, I was supposed to go to New York. And then um, sometime in the middle of May, I got a call from the college that I was waitlisted for in Chicago, and they let me in. And that's where my now wife was going to go to college. And so, like, I had been thinking, I'm going to go this way. And I made this choice to go to New York. Then, oh, a new opportunity came. Chicago is another choice. So I decided to go to Chicago. And just in terms of choices, does that mean I can never go to New York? I can never know what it's like to live in New York? Did I ruin my chances of success as a poet by going to Chicago and versus New York, which is the epicenter of arts and books and poetry? No, because life brings new choices and new opportunities. And, um, a car. <laughs> so if you want to go to New York, you go to New York. You make a choice later. Don't get stuck down in a choice. And that is why those first three stanzas set up that conceit that choice is going to lead to choice is going to lead to choice. So when we're in this past tense, they diverged. They looked like they were fair. That morning they were fair. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to come back. And then that fourth stanza, I shall be telling this with a sigh. Great. That should be taken with a sense of, again, there's humility there. There's self-deprecation, you know, um, a sense of mockery about like, oh, look at me when I'm old, somewhere ages and ages hence. I mean, the speaker can't even be definitive and they know that somewhere. That's vague. As a teacher, if you wrote somewhere, somewhere down the line, where down the line? Ages and ages hence. Again, that emphasis and repetition of ages kind of tells us they're having fun with us as a speaker ages and ages from now. So when I'm old, when I'm really, really old, I'm going to tell this with a sigh. And what's a sigh? <sighs> you know, regret or <sighs> satisfaction? Those, and, and then the repetition of the first lot line broken off. Two roads diverged in a wood. And I, and it's even broken off with a comma there, which I didn't put in my notes, but think about that. And I, further emphasizing the kind of lack of sincerity with the literal, meaning we're really being figurative here. And I, that emphasizes the tone and the self-deprecation. And then it's repeated. I took the one less traveled by. I mean, wouldn't you find that a person who, who, who talks about themselves in, the, in, in that way is kind of arrogant? I took the one less traveled by. Ooh, look at you. You're special. You took the hard road and look at you. It made all the difference. And that's another one of those things that I try to teach my students. And I try to teach people when I hear that language on Facebook or Twitter or any social media or parents or, you know, families, friends, even myself, we got to look at when we use that word all, that's a very short word, but it's a very, a very common word, but it's also a very dangerous word. All, all the difference. It's in a poem. We can't overlook it. It's the third to last word of this poem but it really kind of it's one of those things where you you use language it's a choice and you said all the difference does it really make all the difference because what does that literally mean it means everything 100 percent. we're keeping it 100 
everything has changed because of that moment. Because I decided to go to college when I decided to go to it, not later on. And when we reflect upon that, we have to believe that the speaker is not being sincere, that they are being figurative, that they are knowingly poking fun of themselves because in, in all of those ages and ages, hence, logically, you're going to have a million decisions to make. And so I'm going to leave that as the last thing, uh, last thing in this, in this um, video lecture, uh, but do make sure to read through the second, uh, the pages that come underneath in terms of how, you know, you move through the stanzas and how he sets up that metaphorical conceit to get where we get. Notice some of the, um, how you poke in here, line 16, how you, how you should be representing lines of poems and citing them in some level. I try to, to, to maintain that. Also, my pointing out the rhyme scheme uh, and then making sure to, to let you know about show versus not tell, which is something that when you're a very young writer in your first creative writing workshops, they teach you if you're going to write poems, a lot has to be left off the page because here's the thing that you learn with Robert Frost and you learn um, just about poems in general. If you read them once and you get everything out of it, it's not a good poem. You know, you're not going to go back to it. Roses are red, violets are blue. I love you. Great. Why the hell do we have red, you know, red flowers and, and blue flowers? Those make, those are just to get a rhyme. No, we have to think that there's more to the point than what we're seeing. And as we get older, we can um, see some of those nuances more. And we have to bring our reality into the page. And as someone, as I said, who has spent 30 years, nearly 30 years with Robert Frost, um, I would love if you chose not to write about this poem, but maybe write about another Robert Frost poem or not a Robert Frost poem or any of the poems at all. But I have a couple of suggestions. Uh, Mending Wall is one of, the f one of my favorites from childhood. And so I put that front, uh, and you can see some of the humor there um, in terms of, you know, back in New England days and ancient days, and you may have seen this in like UK imagery or Irish uh, imagery where they have those um, stone walls. Out, out, which is a reference to Hamlet's Macbeth. And there's an epigram there in the poem. And that's a poem in which um, a saw kills a boy. Uh, and so that might be interesting to you. The wood pile. And um, that's, as you see here, I, I clicked on it so I could copy some of my favorite lines ever, especially with the slow, smokeless burning of decay, because it's talking about a fire that isn't even there, but it's metaphorical. The burning of decay. The idea of like, you know, moss and lichen eating away at a, a pile of wood and how it's kind of like fire is um really cool. And then mowing. There's, you know, scythe in there. So those of you who like the Grim Reaper might enjoy that poem. Um, but I hope that this helps you understand this poem. But I also hope it gets you to think more deeply about how you're reading poetry in general and giving you some examples of how to connect what's going on in the poem to your own lives, to the lives we're living. I tried to resist going into the present tense um, so that uh, you have that opportunity to think about how the poem presently works.